Good evening, and welcome to Virtual First Friday at the Custom House Maritime Museum, where we explore our history through presentation and social interaction. This month, we welcome Greg Colling, founding partner of Merrimack Design Architects, LLC, to talk about the history of the 1835 Newburyport Custom House in which the museum resides. Greg has frequently lectured on period styles of architecture, including the church and meeting house architecture of Salisbury and Amesbury, Massachusetts, and even participated in a symposium on the New England Custom Houses of architect Robert Mills, the designer of our custom house here in Newburyport. This led to Merrimack Design Architects providing preservation services for its restoration. He is a member of the Historic New England Council and Preservation Committee, the Boston Society of Architects Historic Resources Committee, and has taught design at the Boston Architectural College and Wentworth Institute of Technology. Tonight, Greg will be sharing with us not only the building and preservation history of our custom house here in Newburyport, but also the cultural and historical origins of its design. Please welcome Greg Colling. Good evening. I'm Greg Colling, an architect with Merrimack Design Architects, founded in Amesbury in 2007, and currently located in Exeter, New Hampshire, and Stratford, Vermont. I'm a former resident of Newburyport and fortunate to still have many good friends and colleagues in the community. I continue to work throughout the Seacoast area, including the Amesbury Carriage Museum, uh, their new industrial history center, which is currently under construction. I have been invited to this, virtu this virtual first Friday of October to talk about the architecture of our custom house update everyone on its ongoing preservation efforts and share some ele elements of its remarkable history. I'd like to start by thanking Karen Carter and Bill Harris for shedding light on the history and importance of this landmark building and for their hard work researching and organizing the 2009 Robert Mills Symposium where I took part presenting the New England Custom Houses of Robert Mills, which became the foundation of the information compiled in this presentation. Thanks also to Bill Finch for his guidance and preservation stewardship over the years, including his 2004 conservation assessment report. And finally, thanks to the museum leadership, all the volunteers, members and staff, past and present for their dedication, enthusiasm and support of this organization. I will begin this presentation with a brief building description and a review of the building's preservation history from 1968 to the present day. I will then describe the original purpose of the building, its architectural significance, unique construction, the architect responsible for its design and some of the, its distinguishing details. The Custom House Maritime Museum is housed in the former US government Custom House located at 25 Water Street on the Merrimack River in Newburyport, Massachusetts. It was built in 1835, along with three other New England custom houses to the design of architect Robert Mills, who lived from 1781 to 1855. The building is constructed in an austere Greek revival style with dressed granite ashlar blocks over a core of brick masonry. The interior masonry floors are supported on a system of brick groin and barrel vaults. The ceiling above the second floor with the exception of a groin vault above the Baker Gallery is suspended below heavy timber trusses. The two original roof trusses were reinforced in 1973 
with steel gusset plates and lateral steel beams were attached to the bottom of the truss cords with steel stirrups. As originally constructed, the building had a sheet metal roof, small paned iron window sash and iron exterior shutters. A section cut through the building is shown on the left in a 1973 architect's drawing and on the right in a drawing from the Mills New London portfolio. Both drawings illustrate the groin and barrel vaults, the roof structure and thick exterior masonry walls. The building underwent major renovations in 1872 that included the installation of a slate roof to replace the original sheet metal roofing and the iron windows were replaced with conventional wood two over two light sash. On the left is an example of a surviving iron shutter at the New London Custom House. And the drawing on the right are details from the Mills portfolio showing an iron shutter and window. The government ceased using the building as a custom house in 1911 and sold it to private interests as a surplus property in 1913. Between 1913 and its acquisition in 1968, under eminent domain proceedings by the Newbury Port Development Authority. It was used for hay storage as a shoe heel factory and a scrap metal yard. Between 1973 and 1975, the building underwent an extensive renovation and restoration project <clears throat> initiated by the Newbury Port Redevelopment Authority. It was readapted as a museum and leased to the Newburyport Maritime Society. The extent of the stabilization work required is apparent on the drawing on the left showing temporary structural bracing. The restoration generally interpreted the building to its 1872 appearance rather than the details of the original 1835 construction. The work includes the work included structural reinforcing, installation of, of a new slate roof, gutters and downspouts, repointing the exterior masonry facades and replacement of all but three of the 1872 wood windows with new sash and frames. In addition, the building was retrofit with new plumbing, electrical and heating systems. And the interior rooms were reframed and plastered. Over subsequent years, the building has experienced extensive damage to interior finishes from water leaks associated with gutters, downspouts, flashings, and, mas and masonry. An ongoing repair program addressed some of the critical water infiltration issues dating back to the Mother's Day flood in May 2006 and prior chronic water infiltration issues. The north facade was repointed in 2005 and the east facade was repointed in 2006, along with replacement of 11 damaged windows and surrounding interior plaster finishes. The south and west facades were repointed and repaired in 2012 with matching funds awarded by the Massachusetts Historic Commission Preservation Projects Fund. On the right is a photo taken shortly after completion of the initial restoration in 1976. The photos on the left show the extent of the window replacement project. The building observatory above the roof is supported between four offset chimneys that originally served eight coal-fired heating stoves within. It has a fancy handrail according to Mill's specification shown on the upper left. In the fall of 2011, the observatory chimneys were repointed and three were capped to prevent water damage to collection storage on the third floor and to the ceilings over exhibit spaces below. The fourth flue serving the boiler was capped in 2013 after a stainless steel liner was installed. The observatory parapet walls were also repointed to prevent water infiltration and wetting of the structure below. I was struck uh, at the time by the fearlessness of the chimney sweep photographed on the right, stuffing the stainless steel liner down the flue while standing with no protection on top of the chimney. 
The roof was replaced in its entirety with flat seam copper and a new access hatch was installed by the Heritage Company in spring 2013. The original surviving wrought iron guardrails were removed, restored and reinstalled by Hammersmith Studios as seen on the bottom left in their shop and in place on the right. Finally note that this observatory guardrail is the only surviving example remaining of the three extant New England custom houses designed by Mills. In December of 2018, the building ownership was transferred from the Newburyport Redevelopment Authority to the Newburyport Maritime Society. With the transfer of ownership, a commitment was made by the Maritime Society to the Newburyport Redevelopment Authority and the city to develop a capital improvement plan for the building. Merrimack Design Architects was brought back on board at this time to assist in planning these improvements and to administer a slate roof replacement project using matching funds secured from the Newburyport Community Preservation Committee. The slate roof was replaced in its entirety in November and December 2019. Victor Wright of the Heritage Company was retained to perform the work based on the excellent quality and craftsmanship of his previous work on the observatory. The slate roof has had been inadequately installed during the 1973 to 75 renovation without a minimum three inch lap on the slates and staggered spacing between slate joints as seen in the Finch and Rose Conservation Assessment Report on the left. In April of this year, in the wake of the COVID-19 shutdown, when planned work on the building was allowed to continue, the ground was excavated along the east facade and a new subsurface drainage system was installed by Fraser Construction, tying in the downspouts to a dry well in the rear yard. This work was intended to address one of the primary causes of moisture related issues in the basement of the building, threatening sensitive collections museum collections within. The downspouts were dumping bulk water directly along the foundation. You can see the effect in this photo of a water saturated floor in the director's office. This past June, the basement hopper windows were restored to full operability, including weather stripping and bronze screen replacement by Allison Hardy of Window Woman of New England based in Amesbury. This work was intended to address humidity and indoor air quality issues, providing the ability to ventilate the basement on dry, clear days, with the added benefit of increasing convection cooling throughout the building during the summer when windows are opened on the upper floors. The Bushy Gallery Southeast window on the second floor is an original 1872 sash and frame. It received epoxy repairs in 2002 and did not require further rep repair during the 2008 window project. Subsequently, the bottom sash failed as shown on the left. It was also recently restored by Window Woman of, of New England along with the frame and parting beads. We're now considering adding interior storm windows in order to improve thermal performance and create a stable interior climate better suited to preserving museum collections. <clears throat> Meanwhile, Joan and Sean, our new executive and assistant director, have been busy with other interior improvements, including reconfiguring interior exhibit spaces, new lighting, painting, casework, and furniture restoration, thanks to the volunteer effort by Joan's cabinet maker husband. The collections on display have been reorganized and exhibits have been updated in order to create more welcoming dynamic and vibrant learning environment and visitors experience. Currently, Merrimack Design Architects are working with the building committee to initiate to restore the Water Street entrance doors and replace the rear aluminum storefront door with a historically appropriate door that will be reinforced to withstand flooding on the water side. 
All of this ongoing work and effort focused primarily on the building envelope will help to ensure the preservation of this building and its collections for the next generation, while also addressing the necessity of sustainability and resiliency with the impact of climate change. Despite all the ongoing preservation work, the Newburyport Custom House retains many architectural features, including the previously mentioned observatory guardrail that survived from the original date of its construction in 1835 that distinguished this building from the other two surviving New England custom houses designed by Robert Mills. They are in New Bedford, Massachusetts on the hill above the Acushnet River, shown on the lower left, and New London, Connecticut on the Thames River, shown on the upper right. Middletown, Connecticut custom house located on the Connecticut River, shown on the lower right, was demolished in 1918 to make way for a new post office. U.S. custom houses were essentially mixed use buildings with offices and storage rooms. They were the federal office buildings of their day, built with money appropriated by Congress and dispersed through the United States Treasury. They established a federal presence at a local level. They were created at a time when 90% of federal revenue was generated through tariffs on traded goods before the Revenue Act of 1861, imposing a tax on income. Custom houses were directly linked to the most important business and transportation system of their day, maritime trade and commerce. The custom collector received all reports and manifests on ships that entered port, surveyed their contents, including imported goods, estimated the amount of duties and received payment for duties. The custom house also served as a storehouse for safekeeping of goods held in bond were impounded until duties were paid. The two views shown highlight New Newburyport's waterfront commercial activity during the 19th century. <clears throat> In addition to the custom collector, the custom house included a naval officer and a ship surveyor. First collector, naval officer, and surveyor at the Newburyport custom house were Samuel Phillips, Benjamin Stickney, and Nathaniel Jackson, respectively. These are 19th century views of New London on the left and Middletown Custom House on the right. I particularly like the Middletown photo on the right with the dog and colorful characters posing on the porch. The operations of a custom house played an important role in the local community. It served as a bank, a storehouse for safekeeping of public records, goods and currency, a post office, a weather station, and an office of weights and measures. This is a 19th century view taken from Market Square with, custom, with the custom house centered in the distance. <clears throat> a comparison between the Salem Custom House on the left and Newburyport on the right illustrates the radical change in architectural style that occurred within a span of 14 years between their construction. The Salem Custom House has many hallmarks of the federal style. It is a two and a half story, five bay brick building with split chimneys, a balustrade and delicately proportioned wood portico framing a fan light door. The design was influenced by English classical sources such as the work of the 18th century Scottish architects, Robert and James Adam in their interpretation of Roman antiquity. Robert Mill's design for the Newburyport Custom House on the right is a clear departure from the style of architecture. Inspired by Greek temple forms, it is a stark, primitive, gray granite building with heavy proportions and minimal ornamental detail. It has a fortress-like appearance and is dominated by a gable roof. The Greek revival style came into fashion between 1820 and 1860 with the advent of the new American Republic. Architects emulated and adapted classical Greek building forms to project strength, stability, and continuity abroad. A new national identity embodied in public buildings symbolized by the origin of democracy in ancient Greece. 
Greek forms were freely adapted and interpreted by Mills and his American contemporaries. Much of the ornament molding enrichment found on Greek temples was stripped in a search for the most economical and functional building designs. Facades were unadorned, rationally composed forms based on mathematical proportion. The column diameter governed the proportions of all building elements from the height of the column and entablature to the smallest molding. Greek Doric temples typically have a proportion of eight and a half diameters, while the English Doric based on classical Roman models typically were much lighter, nine and a half diameters. Some examples of Greek revival style buildings include Boston's Quincy Market on the upper left, the New York Custom House in Lower Manhattan on the upper right, and the Boston Custom House below in a photo taken before a 496 foot tower was added by Peabody and Stearns Architects in 1914. The original glass dome is now contained within the tower. Now let's look at two sources from Greek antiquity. Many examples of ancient Greek buildings are dominated by a formal temple front with columns supporting an entablature and a shallow pediment is seen on the Parthenon on the left or a facade was composed with anti or, pilot or what are called pilasters with columns in between supporting a recessed opening within a wall. For example, the Athenian the Athenian treasury on the right. Mill's custom house was designs departed from these prevailing models. What is unique about Robert Mill's custom house design is that the Greek architectural style is adapted to a building type without use using a columnar temple form. He designed a one-story porch framed by two-story pilasters to suit his purpose. Robert Mills was born in Charleston, South Carolina in 1781. He began his career in architecture as an apprentice under James Hoban, architect at the White House in Washington, DC. This early experience and his talent as a draftsman allowed him to make the acquaintance of Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson encouraged Mills to pursue a career in architecture, making him his protege. He, he sent letters of introduction for travel study program throughout the Northeast states, including a visit to Newburyport. Mills also helped to prepare drawings of Monticello and he was given access to study the most important library of architecture books in America of the day. He later worked for the British trained architect, Benjamin Latrobe in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania working on the extension of the First National Bank of Philadelphia in the US Treasury in Washington, DC, where he gained experience in the design of masonry vaults and fireproof construction. Mills launched his own practice in Philadelphia in 1808 at the age of 27, designing buildings in Baltimore, Philadelphia, and South Carolina before moving his practice to Washington, DC in 1830. He secured a position as a draftsman at the General Land Office, a Bureau of the Treasury Department through his previous federal government connections. In 1836, Mills was appointed federal architect by President Andrew Jackson, serving until 1852. Mills became a nationally prominent architect designing over 160 projects, including many important buildings the County Records Office in Charleston, South Carolina on the left, the US Patent Office in the center, the Washington National Monument on the right, and the US Treasury Building shown in the previous slide in its familiar form appearing on the back of the US $10 bill. On August 14th, 1814, during the War of 1812, British troops marched on Washington and set fire to the US Capitol. In March, 1833, the third US Treasury building burned in an arson fire with only the fireproof wing designed by Latrobe left standing. 
Mill's prior experience under Latrobe made him well suited to taking on the task of designing and engineering fireproof buildings. In July 1833, Congress appropriated funds for the design and construction of custom houses in Newburyport and New Bedford, Massachusetts, and in New London and Middletown, Connecticut. At the time, 90% of federal revenue was secured through custom duties. Fires were an unfortunate common occurrence in many US cities at the time, including Newburyport. In 1811, an extensive fire destroyed the original downtown. Mills in his position in the federal government advocated for fireproof construction and requested appropriations to cover the additional cost of masonry groin vault construction. On January 14th, 1873, the pain block to the east side of the Newburyport Custom House was gutted by fire. Custom House survived the fire due to Mill's insistence for fireproof construction. In this stereoscopic image, the pane block appears in the center and the Custom House is on the left. You can just see the porch peeking out from underneath the tree. Evidence of this fire after 147 years can still be seen on the east side shown uh, within the red box where the effect of the heat from the fire spalled the granite facade. The stone surfaces in the affected area appear worn and softened. The effect is similar to the stone finishing technique called a flamed or thermal finish by applying a high temperature flame to the surface of cut stone to create a smooth, lightly stippled finish. Now I will transition to describe the building construction. Fireproof Newburyport Custom House has a cruciform plan with intersecting masonry burial vaults, surrounded by four masonry groin vaulted rooms, shown on the plan on the left. Groin vaults are formed by two intersecting barrel vaults. The, the four rooms <clears throat> surrounding the center are not square. They're roughly 14 feet by 22 feet. Therefore, the vaults are elliptical in shape, as shown on the right. The intersecting masonry arches were built with wood forms, shown on the left, in a process called arch centering. The arch height is a quarter of the span. The spring line of the arches are roughly 13 feet high. The outward thrust of the arches are resisted by masonry piers at the corners. The voids above the vaults are leveled with sand to create the floor above. The floor thickness is 12 inches at the apex. The masonry groin vaults on the first floor are finished with three coat plaster. Although masonry groin vaults are an ancient architectural form, they were a novel method of fireproof construction in, in America at the time. Masons were unfamiliar with the techniques needed to form a groin vault. In fact, Mills traveled to Newburyport in August 1834 during construction to instruct the local carpenters and masons in this novel technique. Another novel construction technique employed in the Newburyport Custom House building design is the beautiful hanging stair. All three extant custom house houses contain hanging stairs or what are often incorrectly called cantilever stairs. This type of winding stair form with an open well in the center was employed in part to increase interior daylight. Hanging stairs are elegant and appear to defy gravity by their graceful movement between static floor levels. The stair treads were constructed in tandem with the surrounding masonry walls so that the treads were, were locked into each masonry course as work progressed. The Newburyport Custom House stair is constructed of unrabbited solid granite treads with a half inch overlap shown on the left. The back edge of each tread supports the weight from above the vertical load while the leading edge is supported by the tread below. The masonry wall 
carries the counterclockwise torsion from these two opposing vertical forces. The rectangular section of the treads are strong in torsion. The photo on the upper right is marked with arrows indicating the direction of these forces. The largest load occurs at the second tread above the first floor because it carries the weight of the entire flight above while the curtail step beneath rests on the floor shown on the bottom right. A plate from Asher Benjamin's practi practical house carpenter shows a method for constructing a stair handrail wreath and curtail step using a four center drawing method similar to an ionic volute or the progressive shape of a nautilus shell. Although this example is for a wood stair, the knowledge and principles are similar for laying out stone, for laying out a stone curtail step. This was common knowledge to craftsmen and stair builders at the time, going back to the colonial period and Georgian England. <clears throat> The New London and New Bedford hanging stairs are constructed with freestone, otherwise known as brownstone, a soft sedimentary stone, most likely quarried across the Connecticut River from Middletown. The first floor run is rectangular, like the Newburyport example, but the treads of the second flight are rabbited with a sloped underside. They appear to float by virtue of their thin cross section and smooth sloped underside. Treads are locked together with a rabbit or rebate that allows for a thin cross section. The vertical face of the rabbit captures the horizontal forces acting in opposing directions at the top and bottom of each tread. The counterclockwise torsion shown previously in the unrabbited stair is thereby resisted by the vertical joint, creating an opposing rotational force reducing the torsion in the wall and need for a heavy tread cross section. The force diagram is shown on the lower right. New Bedford stair is similar in New London, but with a more pronounced curtail step shown on the left. The photo on the upper right highlights the thin gravity defying stair cross section. It is my hope that by sharing these architectural features and building history from present day efforts to its original design and construction in 1834, highlight the importance of this unique building and the need for its continual maintenance and preservation. The Newburyport Custom House was born by necessity to protect public records from fire and to establish a federal presence to control maritime trade at the confluence of the Merrimack River and the Atlantic Ocean. The architect Robert Mills drew upon Greek revival architectural sources to project a new national identity of strength, stability, and continuity, symbolized by the origin of democracy in ancient Greece. Mills' design is characterized by a heavy-handed simplicity. Some would say it's homely, but it reflects the earnest pursuit to define a purely American style of architecture. Employing his experience designing fireproof buildings, Mills adapted this building language to suit locally available materials and labor while working with limited funds appropriated by Congress to create an economical fireproof building design solution for Newburyport. Thanks to the progressive leadership and the arm of the Newburyport Redevelopment Authority in 1968, this building was saved from, from destruction and adapted to again serve the public as a maritime museum. Newburyport is fortunate to have this cultural resource as the centerpiece of its historic waterfront. It is the responsibility of the Newburyport community to be good stewards and to convey to future generations the rich architectural history and significance of this building, both locally and as part of our nation's history. Thank you very much. Hey, Greg, great job.
Well, thank you. That was awesome. Is that Susan? It I'd is. Like to take this opportunity to yeah. thank not only our presenter tonight, but to all of you joining us here for our latest virtual First Friday. For those of you joining us on Zoom, we're going to open things up for a live Q&A. Please feel free to turn on your video and audio at this time. And thank you again from all of us at the Custom House Maritime Museum. Hi, everybody. So uh, if anyone has any questions in our audience, uh, you feel free to jump in anytime you like and ask Greg any questions you might like. Uh, but to kick things off, you know, if you want to think of a question or put it in the in the chat. Uh, in the meantime, uh, Greg, you uh, mentioned a lot of the original features of uh, the custom house, such as the observatory railing and the window sashes that had a lot of work done on them to try to preserve them. Um, what are some of the challenges with trying to preserve uh, these original elements as opposed to just replacing them with modern materials? Well, um, what's interesting about the observatory guardrail is um, that the other two custom houses, when the um, surveyors were on the route, you know, they, they'd go up on the observatory to observe ships coming into port and they were up often up there during the winter time. <laughs> if you've ever been up on on the observatory on a cold day, <laughs> it's very bracing. So um, they the the Middletown Custom House and the um, the Newbury the um, the New Bedford Custom House both of those observatories had been covered with later structures. They had built wood enclosures up over the observatories and they, they took the railings off. And um, actually in, in um, the New London Custom House, they took the, whole, the entire roof off and the observatory and they replaced it with a hipped roof. Mm. So um, that's kind of interesting too, because New London, the Custom House in New London has the original Robert Mills portfolio for his New England custom houses. And I think that that portfolio was generic and I think it, it was used to illustrate all of the custom houses. And then there were variations that were made. Um, for example, the, the portfolio um, shows a, a gable front similar to the Newburyport custom house when in fact in New London, there's, there's just a hipped roof and there's just a, a straight cornice. So it's, it's interesting to me and, um, you know, I'm a practicing architect, I'm not a scholar and I wish I had time <laughs> to research all this stuff um, because it's, I, I think it's all fascinating and, and um, I hope that the presentation brings to light how how fascinating this building is and, and all the things, um, you know, that it's not just an individual standalone building in Newburyport, that it relates to all these other buildings that Mills designed, including the other custom houses in New England. Yeah, so those, those original features uh, have disappeared from a lot of the other custom houses then. Yeah, the, um, the other feature that, that Newburyport has that the other, the New Bedford and, and New London don't is um, it has the original doors, which is um, quite surprising given the condition of the building um, when it was a shoe heel factory and a, and a junkyard. Apparently um, friends from Newburyport that lived there in the early days, remember submarine parts sticking out of the windows. Um, it's, somehow they, they kept those doors. They were removed in, in, um, in um, New Bedford and in Middletown, they have a pair of doors that purportedly are, were made from oak timbers from the USS Constitution. Wow. So the, uh, the next project you're working on with the museum then, as you're saying, is on those doors. Yes, um, they're actually in 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 very good condition. The 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 issues are that um, 
the they there's air leakage. There's the the doors are set with iron pintles that are um, fastened to the granite architrave, the surround of the door. And there's a gap between the door and this. It's the door is closed directly um, in a stone opening. So there's no weather stripping. <laughs> so air just goes through through the through the, the gap between the doors and the stone. And um, we're gonna look at solutions to air seal those doors and also um, replace the lock on it with a more historically appropriate uh, cast iron rim lock with a big skeleton key. So would you say that's probably one of the uh, biggest challenges you go through in working with historic structures is trying to you know, kind of get them up to a, at least a modern standard of you know, air tightness and, and, and you know, so it's protecting the interior of the building while still retaining the historical character? Yes, I think the biggest challenge is is um, is intervening with a historical building and and making an alteration while preserving the existing building fabric and what you know whatever we do we try to design it so that it's reversible so that it can be taken away so we don't want to you know cut a kerf into the stone and stick a weather strip in there <laughs> at the front doors, you know, we're gonna have to find some some way to um, to weather seal that without damaging the stone architrave and without damaging the doors. Greg, I just have to say, I really enjoy going through those doors every morning. I purposely go in the front because the back doors are so horrendous <laughs> with the lock and everything else to struggle right. to get in. But what an honor because you know the building is real this is this is sort of our um appeal this year um and the annual appeal was the mosley galley last last year and this year will be um to continue sort of securing the parameter with the environment and putting on the floodgates and so forth should we have another mother's day flood um at least we've taken precautionary measures but you know the building's 185 years old and i I remember talking to an architect a couple of years back and they told me that most buildings being made today have a life expectancy of 50 years. You know, not, not just only the um, HVAC system, but the fire sprinkler, the fire announcers. I mean, so, you know, we look at this building and I look through the files and I see lots of projects and lots of restorations. And I, I just think that sometimes, um, you think you fix something and you're done, but in a building like that, you constantly are going back to maintain. Right. And once you start doing deferring in that maintenance, then you really have problems. So it's really right. about keeping up, keeping on and, and keeping things maintained, which you have to do. Yes. Yes, building materials have a lifespan, uh, you know, but, you know, older buildings were, you know, labor was cheaper and materials were cheaper and and there was more craftsmanship, I think, in, in most cases than there is today. And that's why I love historic buildings as an architect. You know, I live in an 1800 house now in, in Stratford, Vermont. And the quality of the construction and, you know, can, you know, well, I just feel like I'm a steward and of my home and then also of the new report custom house because these buildings they they last a long time because they were built well but they require upkeep so the um you know for example most of the windows in the custom house have been replaced because their wood and wood over time decays if it's not properly maintained and if you know it isn't if painting isn't kept up with and things like that and caulking around joints between the windows and the stone. Anytime water gets in mm -hmm. to um, a, a construction or an exterior wall assembly, it wreaks havoc. And, you know, the custom house building, we're still dealing with problems, you know, chronic problems that occurred before any of us were around when the building was was um, abused and, and water was let 
let in through the roof, the gutters failed. There's actually a cavity between the exterior um, base granite on the building and the, and the brick masonry backup. There's a, um, a space in there and all the mortar from the brick and the stone has eroded away from water, from water infiltration. It just eroded the, the materials and, and washed all the, the mortar down the, the wall cavities. And Bill Finch, the preservation consultant that's been involved with this over the years has some great photographs of, of some of these issues. And I think a lot of people don't realize, you know, it looks like this, you know, it looks like a mausoleum. It's this thick, heavy granite building, but it's still, you know, these, these things, need, these types of buildings need to be maintained. Masonry needs to be repointed um, and to keep the water from getting in behind the stones and the brick, so. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the building is the biggest item in the museum collection and like all other items in the collection, they are subject to the ravages of time and need to be taken care of. Um, Greg, you know, I was gonna... I, I, I'm gonna interject. I'm gonna go back to your cantilever stairs, Greg. Um, that, <laughs> when that was put in in 1835. Where did that, was that new to the American architecture or did that come over from Europe? Um, well, the French were the masters of stonework or what, what is called stereotomy. I mean, there's, there was that Rondell photo that I showed of the arch centering. Yep. And, um, you know, in your, in the, the Romans and, and the Gauls, you know, have had stonework that's gone back for centuries. Well, I and, saw it in and, and they've had and they had guilds that you know stonemasons that built these buildings. So there, you know, if you go into um, you know the basements of buildings in Paris, for example, you see these beautiful mason, you know, um, limestone um, groin vaulted spaces. Um, so it's you know there's beautiful finished stair work in. Um, um, on the Ile de um, in Paris. Um, so on the name of the building, it's one of the um, one of the government buildings has beautiful winding stairs that are stone that are all made out of small pieces of stone that are all assembled and carved. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, in any case, this building, the the cantilever stairs were um, Mill's contemporaries were also building um, cantilever stairs. Um, Alexander Paris worked on the Mass General Hospital in Boston. If I would, I would um, recommend anybody who's visiting the hospital to go take a look at the um, at the original building that was designed by um, Charles Bullfinch and then Alexander Paris um, finished the building when Bullfinch was went to Washington, and that has beautiful cantilever stairs. And then it also has an operating theater on the top floor with a with a glass dome. That's just one of the coolest spaces in Boston. Mm -hmm. So, I was going to ask actually that kind of ties in well. Um, you know, someone in your profession obviously has to know the history of architecture and design and the cultural origins and things like that. But not everybody goes into working with historic structures. So, what drew you to actually working with historic structures? Well, I think um, I've always appreciated, I grew up in uh, Newton, Massachusetts and Newton had the Sudbury Aqueduct that ran through it. And there were these beautiful um, pump stations that were um, Victorian, either um, Gothic designs and there were classical buildings. And, um, and now there's the, um, the museum on, on Cleveland Circle there, the, um, the Massachusetts Water Resources Authority um, um, Museum. museum. Is, that Is it the Waterworks Museum? The Waterworks Museum, yeah. yeah. So, the, you know, that's a beautiful Richardsonian Romanesque brownstone building. So I grew up in that context and, and those buildings to me, you know, represented permanence and, and this kind of civic dignity. And, and faith in government and, you know, that the waterworks could, could, you know, provide clean, you know, the water system would provide 
clean drinking water to the city. And so that, that was sort of the beginning for me. And then, you know, I, as I um, learned and became an architect, you know, the, the quality of construction of older buildings, that's what drew me to, you know, I like, I, I like well-made things. <laughs> it's, and that applies to everything, not just architecture. So that's what, that's my, my inspiration and what, what fuels my, my, um, you know, my practice and what I do. Seems like you have a particular affinity for civic architecture. Hey, I, I wanted to just jump in on, I, I've got to ring off in just a little bit, but this is my first, first Friday with the custom house. <laughs> Hi, John. Hi, John. Hey, nice to see you, Sean, <laughs> Joan, and, and Greg. Um, you know, and what a great um, review of the restoration work. I mean, I, one thing I feel really strongly, it's so important for our cultural organizations to set a standard or an example for doing restoration work. Greg, your comments about, you know, quality workmanship and materials. I mean, I, I guess I, I always hope that the this kind of work that the Custom House is doing can, you know, shine a light or, or you know, forge a pathway that others will follow. So, you know, a commitment to preservation all, you know, spread throughout the community. Right. Um, I, I, you know, here in Portsmouth where I live, you know, we are, you know, blessed with the richness of historic organizations. And I'm frankly appalled at some of the work that's happening. And I, it just makes me wonder whether, you know, there's a disconnect in, you know, the historic vision of these places and what's being interpreted by developers and property owners and real estate people and so on. Well, that's that's one of the points of my lecture. I think is is that there was a building language. Mm. There was a, a language that that builders understood, that that developers understood, and architects, and they practiced the language. and And that language has been lost, I think. And people don't, you know, people look at a building like the Custom House, and they don't even understand it. They don't know how to look at it, what right. it means, and and um, and you know, and and have any understanding of, of it, and and I find that across the board, and it's not just just you know, lay people, it's also architects. There are a lot of architects that you know. I agree. After, after World War II, you know, Walter Gropius came to Harvard, and and they did clean slate. The Beaux Arts. Um, program of architecture was was wiped out so there was no mm -hmm. no looking back at history right and architects that had done, designed beautiful buildings before us mm -hmm. you know there was this this bizarre concept that architects have to be this you know the creative origin of some new new thing you know i because there are architects like frank lloyd wright mm. you know he's frankly a genius and he was able to experiment and develop new forms, but most architects, you know, I think would be better served and, and create better buildings if they looked back at precedent and, right. and, and, and tried to understand the language of building like in Portsmouth right. and in Newburyport where you see a lot of new work done where there's no, no, no effort to understand even when architects try to design a building that looks quote historical you know, you see a lot of these sort of Victorian piles uh, around on the seacoast and that are supposed to look kind of Victorian and like these cottages, but there's nothing about them that has good proportions or, or looks, or, you know, they're looking back at, at the building tradition. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's like any other art form. It, it needs to be understood from a perspective of what came before in order to do something new. You know, I mean, I think there, there are, you know, some really experimental architects like like Frank Gehry, who are just you know doing wild stuff, but that's because he understands what came before and can then play with the proportions. Oh yeah, no, a lot of you know Le Corbusier, who was the you know the icon of modern architecture, you know studied classical architecture, and his first buildings were were these vernacular buildings in Switzerland. So. Yeah. I I think Picasso is another good example. I mean, right. he was a very, yeah. very, very traditional artist before right. he did what he became known for, you know? Right.
Yeah. I mean, I liken it to jazz music where, you know, you, you have to learn how to play music Understand and, it. and be good at it before you can take that music and then then riff on it and yeah. do, um, um, what's the word? Um, know the rules before you can break them. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, where you can improvise, you know, and architects that are good can improvise and develop new forms. But we're very blessed to see what we have at the Custom House and we're very fortunate, Greg, that you're involved with it. Oh, thanks. Um, thank you so much. Well, I, I think you guys. Thank you. Bye, John. Bye, John. Bye, John. Thanks. We are very fortunate, though, to have you there and to be part of the building committee. I, and I'm, I'm curious as to see, uh, I mean, you did mention uh, just before, I know we probably got to wrap up. I'm sure you got places to go. Um, but I, I'm curious though, with the, the back door of the building, you know, the front door is, the front doors are original. And so trying to maintain the historical character of those doors is one set of challenges. And you mentioned trying to put something historically appropriate on the back. You know, I'm curious as to what that might look like. Well, that was sort of, I, I, that I, I stated that, and that's sort of a challenge to myself to come up with a solution. I, I looked at the mills, uh, the original contract for the building and there's nothing descriptive about the doors. And I'm gonna do a little bit more research to see what I can find from other buildings of that period that are similar and see if I could find um, some historic photos of, of a door. But I'm thinking that it would be something solid, you know, with um, V group boards, you know, um, a built up door that had a, a, an oak frame with boards sheathing over it, either diagonal or um, or vertical. I think it would really um, enhance the, the back of the building. building. Yeah. yeah, I think it would and really think enhance the whole worked, facade. When I was a draftsman, I worked on the um, on, at, on a building at the um, Arnold Arboretum in Boston, um, and um, the the main building there, and. Um, it had a pair of big pair of pocket doors that came together and, and I got to do the drawing details of that. And, um, and that was inspiring. And that's kind of what I think so it has to be something, you know, this is a heavy fortress like building. So it has to be, you know, the doors are gonna have to be muscular. Well, this will well, be a good challenge because you're taking everything that you've learned as an architect and you're making something new. <laughs> right. I'm improvising. <laughs> <laughs> Go back to the Arboretum in Laz Anderson and see what they right. have. Right, right. Yeah. Well, that's a good idea. Yeah, the Laz Anderson doors, I think of as well. Yeah. Yeah, I used to live in JP, so mm -hmm. uh, I love before I moved to Newburyport and love I love JP as well, yeah. as well as Newburyport. Yeah. Well, thank you all. It seems like it was a really um, wonderful presentation, Greg. I feel like I learned a lot, and and to have those uh, stereoscopic or um, yeah, the the the, 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 um, the picture that showed the fire was really wonderful because we've been trying to nail down that um, right sort of story and and actually lock it in with the date. So and and. Yeah. Jeff, I was just going to say thanks to Jack, who's turned himself on. He's done, done double duty today with doing yeet yeet as well at noon. I know I missed it. My life uh, is on Zoom now. <laughs> <laughs> so that's uh, as are many of us. <laughs> right. Yes, I know this right is a famous date for you, Jack. Right? Yeah. Wasn't this a famous date in Newburyport history? Didn't some, wasn't this the death of some reverend? Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Was that Whitfield. about you e. e. today? Whitfield? Yeah. Whit yeah. Whitfield's death was today. We just had a week Whit long 250th anniversary uh, uh, where every night there was a lecture uh, about Whitfield and his legacy. Oh, really? Oh. Well, I could go on about the architecture, too, that's related to Whitfield. I don't know if you've seen the, the cenotaph that's in the Old South Meeting House on Federal Street. Mm. That was designed by William Strickland, a, a really important architect from Philadelphia, and it's in the Greek style. It's really beautiful. It's a marble cenotaph. 
I'll, I'll, wow. I'll brag a little bit. You can't see the house behind me. I'm at home. But, but this home is where Ned uh, Wheelwright, Edmund Wheelwright, grew up in for at least a few years because it was his great gra his uh, grandfather's, great grandfather's home. Um, so he, he pranced around here. And Ned had designed the, as you, I'm sure you know, Greg, the uh, Longfellow Bridge in Boston, and and it, and that uh, that brownstone waterworks. Uh, oh, did it? A wheelwright design. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. I didn't know. I didn't know that. I'll have to look it up. <laughs> well, you just fed that one in, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> now that we've come full circle. Right. All right. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, that Susan. Great. Thank you, Greg. That was really great. I hope Thank you very much. Liked it, too. Bye. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Bye. Bye. Good night.